they could stick Valentine onto you know the coattails of Extreme. They they did. So we are always grateful. Seriously, like right after us at Soundcheck, Pantera, who was not really popular yet, were like sound checking right with us. And I remember Dime was like with all his Randalls. I'm like he was showing me all his Randall amps. He wasn't even like he wasn't hugely famous yet. It was pretty. I'm, it was wild. Gerard. Ali Sheedy was friends with Valerie Bartonelli, and Gerard used to go hang out at 5150. Earlier I mentioned I got the book that Steve Rosen wrote. Yeah. And I promised him once I finished it, I would tell him a very unique Eddie Van Halen story that he probably doesn't even know. So now he'll hear We're gonna it hear? first. Yeah. Yes. So... Hey everybody, it is Derek, AKA Mr. Shred with Masters of Shred, and we are here at the Tennessee Shred Den for a very special new episode of Talking Shred with two fellow brothers in Shred that have been featured many times, so their faces may look a little bit familiar. I'm talking about none other than the mighty Adam Holland and Gerard Zappa. Hello, thanks How you for having me. They guys coming out here, right? I love this place. Awesome. This is the Shred Den. I love we're, it. We're in, the, we're in the new Shred Den. It's exciting. Thanks With for new guitars, fun. new gear, and not just the guitar player. We have a lifelong bass player here, too. We do. Thank you. So this is going to be a is, very special episode. You know, it is almost lifelong. <laughs> right? We're, we're going to talk about that, too, as well. Yes, yes. Now, you know, having a guitar on you, you're going to have to play us into this episode. No way. Oh my gosh, that doesn't take you back, what does? That's awesome. Now for you that don't know, he was just playing, what song? No, no way. way. There you go, by who? Valentine. Valentine, that's right. Who was signed with who? Uh, money. We had three signs. We had Columbia, Columbia <laughs> Warner Brothers. Giant, yes. Warner Brothers, signs, which it. that album came out on. Right, it came out on Warner Brothers, started on Columbia, but Warner Brothers. And in that video, you played what guitar now? I played my ESP. Purple, purple, purple People Eater. Yes. It had the eyes on it too, and the triangles, yes, right? Yes. Whatever like happened guitar. to that guitar? I sold it to actually a tech who used to work for us, who had it for years. He kept it safe, but I tried to find it, and it, he had sold it, and it's gone. Uh, he doesn't know who he sold no, it to. Just... He does, but I, I actually reached out to the guy he sold it to, but he also, it's been sold three times. Did Duresta build that guitar? No, that's a different one. Duresta built the green one. Oh, okay. But either way, no, two guitars I'm trying to locate. One was the Chevron, black and yellow striped Charvel. I remember that one. Wow. You showed me a picture of that right. even when you were like really young. Right. right. I came in with high that school. That was right. right. The basement. One wall, and the right. purple ESP, if they're, if they're out there, I'd love to find them. Those are pretty sick guitars. Yeah, they were great. And that was in the music video it for was. No Way. Yes. Yep. You know who also is in that music video? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to talk about this, okay? Five years before that music video came out. There was a very popular movie that became a pop culture staple. I'm talking about The Breakfast Club, okay? And in that video you watch, Ali Sheedy is in that music video as a stalker fan that is trying so hard to get in to that rehearsal. It was the highlight of her career. And then when she... <laughs> Stop. <laughs> I think we you're, could agree. It was, it was. How did that come about? I was dating her at the time, and actually she was doing a movie with John Candy at the time. And John Candy was actually going to do the video for us. And then something came up with his schedule, what have you. He couldn't do it. And we asked Allie, and she graciously did it and was awesome in it. And we had a blast doing no it. And I don't know if you know this, I just heard Andrew McCarthy is now it. doing a thing on the Brat Pack, the Brat Pack some right. documentary. It good. It's just coming out. Yeah, that's, uh, wow. You, saw it? you actually saw great, Oh, great. I want to see it. I haven't seen it. So, wow. yeah, it was fun. We had a great time. And the guy who directed it, yes. Rick Friedberg, right, did half the a teacher. Half a Teacher video of Van Halen. No kidding. Uh huh. So we were psyched. We were like, cool, man. So we were, you know, he brought that sort of comedic vibe. So, like, you know, where it was like, we're playing and this crazy person's trying to get in and she's putting on all the disguises. So definitely he had that comedic element from Hot, the, Hot for Teacher. And we were like, cool, man. Because, you know, you could play live, but we needed something more to happen in the video. So. He brought that storyline. Yeah. It was fun. Wow. So let me ask you a question then. So you're telling me that John Candy was going to be 
the stalker fan at your rehearsal? We don't know what the story right. was at that time. They hadn't written it. He had just agreed he would do it. He was a very cool guy. And then she got involved, and they started writing the script for that, and that's how it came. That's we, pretty good. We weren't really that involved in, in well, that yeah. at all, not in the story yeah. at all. Right. No. No. But, but you were cool. telling me, too, though, back when down that time, you guys would go out to New York City a lot down there downtown with everybody, right? With Ali Sheedy and everybody? We go out, yeah. We live <laughs> oh, well, Haman, Haman <laughs> lived down there. Right, so yeah, I, lived down, right. I lived downtown with my friend, and Ali Sheedy's mom lived across the street, which we didn't even know till later, but we lived in New York, so yeah, we would all go hang out. Now, I may be wrong on this. My pop culture radar may be totally off, but the John Candy movie you're talking about with Ali Sheedy, was that Uncle Buck? Only the Lonely. Ah, damn. Okay. Yeah, I was way off. Close. Yeah. Right. She played a mortician. Yeah, she makeup. wasn't in Uncle Buck. I'm thinking of the, no. da the daughter was somebody yeah, else that was Macaulay Culkin's sister, right? Did, was it what, did I he have a sister? So. I don't remember. I'm oh, sure. I'll have to cut that part out. <laughs> that's insulting. My intelligence on how that is. Okay. So that's actually. Now, I don't know if people know this, but you guys came up with some other popular bands, too, that, I mean, we still hear about today. Extreme. Yes. I've featured. Articles with you guys in it from old metal lick. Well, it was called, it was called, it was called Metal Licks magazine. Right. And it was like the, uh, the uh, Foundation Forum 1990. Yep. Right. There was events like that where you guys were with Extreme. And were you guys on the same label at some point? We were the same managers. Same managers. So they, you know, we were like the, like the middle child who was always like, we got like C's, but they were like the star athletes, dude. They were like gold record, platinum, multi you know, hits and everything. We were always like poor Valentine. <laughs> so they were very gracious, and our managers would any gig that was either we could get on with them, we got on. So we did. We played some great gigs with them. We did a little tour with Valentine Extreme and Kings X, which was sick. Oh, man. and we played with like them in Danger Danger. We we've done a bunch, and we did that Foundations Forum. So anywhere they could stick Valentine onto, you know, the coattails of Extreme, they they did. So we are always grateful. And, you know, we were big fans, so it was nice to get to watch them as well. It was pretty cool. The thing I remember most about that Foundations Forum gig was about a half-hour conversation with Dave Mustaine about politics. Even back then? I, he was a yeah, yeah. bright guy, and he was great, and we talked and talked, and we had a good time. And uh, my, my, speaking of that Foundations Forum gig, so we played, on the night we played, a Judas Priest like headlined, right? We were like, are we going to be heavy enough? But, but seriously, like right after us, at Soundcheck, Pantera, who was not really popular yet, were like soundchecking right with us. And I remember Dime was like, with all his Randalls, I'm like, he was showing me all his Randall amps. And he wasn't even like, he wasn't hugely famous yet. It was pretty, I'm, it was wild. It's funny you mentioned that because you guys were actually ranked as one of the hottest bands of the time in one of these metal magazines. And literally in this article, and we'll show it on the screen, you were right next to Pantera. Pantera was in the same group as you, wow. two other bands. Pantera was the one right next to you. They said, yeah. keep a watch on these guys, these bands. Right. Clearly, uh, so. something happened with us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Something went awry, but uh, either way, Pantera so went on. Let's talk about that. So Dimebag told you about his amps. This was before they broke out. Right, right, he was be still right before they broke out. Right he was before. playing those Randalls, right? Yes. Which I think were the, what are they called? The, uh, the, I always get wrong. It's the 80s. Was it the RS 80s or the RE 80s? I actually have no Solid idea, state. but it was like that classic, like he had a wall of these amps, and it was just like... Holy Sorry. shit, like, who, first of all, who is this guy? I'm like, it was wild, because he wasn't, like, known yet, but yeah. he was as close as this, like, hey, dude, like, guitar geek. And what out. a huge jump from what they sounded like. Literally, right, right. complete hair metal band. And then, sounds right, like, right. overnight, they cut their jeans, right. started rocking shorts, grew out the beards, and all of a sudden, their tone went to just this ballistic heaviness. It almost doesn't even seem natural this was, how you could this make the, a shift like that. This was the a ballistic. Lot of bands were doing that. But this was this was the ballistic. They were at the beginning of the ballistic heavy phase. It wasn't the hair metal. It was right. The, they were they were like in that dirty nasty vibe. Right. Isn't that so wild? So that's also another band that you guys I believe are photographed with too was White Lion. At one point, right? Wasn't there another gig that happened? Yes. I think it was at Lemoore's. Lemoore's, yes. right? It was like. Crazy snowstorm. I don't know what the event was, but it was like Jerry Mil Miller from Metal Edge was like sort of. I don't. She was like the. Ho I'm not sure if she hosted it or what it was, but like there was a bunch of guys who went there. I think it was White Lions gig, but then like Extreme played. I think Danger Danger played. Maybe Warrant played. I don't know. It was something like that. There's a photo I believe with you guys um, behind, uh, like kneeling right over, and it was Vito Brada. 
uh, Nuno Betancourt, and I believe that Nuno Betancourt is actually playing Vito Rada Steinberger, yes. which had like three humbuckers on it at one yes. point too, during the performance. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. So that's just like, did you guys ever meet Vito Rada? We he was out in New York too, Staten Island, we, right? We met him a few times, but I, know, I mean, just at events, type, you know, or at that gig, things like that. Really? And Steve was really friendly with those guys. Right. He's from Staten Right, exactly. Steve really? Jerry. Right. Yeah. So, which is another thing that we have to get into. You guys play with Steve Ajiri. And that's why right. I saw you guys a couple times. Right. Epcot, right. Eat to the Beat. I mean, all these different shows right. you guys are doing. You guys are killing it. Thank solid, you. solid band with him. So what's, what, what's on the radar with that? Because this year has been a little quiet, right? Or This year, actually, believe it or not, last year was quiet because Steve did a big tour with the Brett Michaels um, oh, Party yeah. Gras. And this year, the Steve Ajiri band is... You know, reaping the benefits of that exposure. This is probably the busiest year for the Steve Jury Band in the over a decade we've been doing this. This is uh, seriously off the charts. We're nonstop this year. That's pretty great. It is great. Yeah, something you don't you don't see the, too often. But it's, it's great to see that. And those shows are awesome. We've been to all of them. And it's just you've like you've been to a few. That we appre- you've seen some good ones. You've seen yeah, we've seen, Ep- you saw Sea World. They're which all was good. Great. They're all great. That was yeah. a good one. Sea World, Epcot. You've seen a couple of good ones, definitely for sure. Yeah, so that was actually really good. And then outside of that, you had time to recently. Put out a solo album. Is this Correct. your first solo album? It is my first solo album. Instrumental solo album. Correct. Right? Okay. Called Rapture. Correct. Right? So tell us a little bit of what inspired you to do that album. Well, COVID, we were all, you know, at home, obviously not sure what to do. And, you know, that was when I first started, really got into Instagram. And I started to make these little tracks that I would then jam over. And these one minute, I call them one minute songs. And a few of those became... Real, you know, eventually I'm like, wow, this could be something. And that really inspired it. But I always was hesitant to make like a long form instrumental because I'm like, I don't know if I write those kind of songs. Like, how do you, I'm not sure even how to do it. But I just decided to make regular songs and then play guitar to the melody as opposed to, you know, they're still three and a half minute pop songs. Right. And at the same time, Gerard was getting into a lot of loop based production and cool stuff that really lended itself to more instrumental stuff than just lyrical i'm like wow it inspired me to you know go forward and plus we had a good time doing it i always wanted to do it and um we enjoyed the process and it just evolved and obviously i invited you to play on it which we'll talk about later right. but so it just became Woo! yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's a <laughs> lot of weird shit in that so one so either way that, so it, then then, sure then i love it <laughs> so then we decided to take some of those songs we wrote a few more songs and make them a, a, make make it real. But also, I tried to keep the songs, again, no, no longer than four minutes. I wanted to keep them real songs. And I didn't, I only did eight songs. I tried to keep it old school, like, you know, LP, like 30 right. minutes as opposed to 60 minutes, so. And your tone is great, so Thank wh- you. what kind of amp were you using for that? A bunch of things. I used mostly my Fractal, which I, just, just has so, so much diversity. And a lot of the amp sounds inside of Logic, to, uh, there was a bunch of, like a lot of those cool atmospheric things are, some of the crazy like experimental sounds inside of Logic, which could emulate a keyboard. So I used a lot of those, but mostly, no. mostly my Fractal FM3 is the main sound. You know, it's crazy how far that stuff's come. It's amazing. You can't the mic anything anymore. No, it's straight up. Not, unfor- not unfortunate, but there's no those. Uh, the Fractal was really. Plus, I think I had just really gotten into the Fractal during COVID, so I was really diving deep into it anyway. Yeah. And there might be some leftover Helix Line Six stuff in there too, recorded. I think. You know, but the, the, the predecessor to those type of programmable digital pieces now, back in the day when you would first get that, you'd have, like, the power station drums. I mean, there were right. guys literally miking and doing right. and all that work for you, you know. So right. it wasn't just kind of digital right. AI type of technology. Right. It was like... Wow. So even then. But it was great. Which is a tough thing, too. I know that I think uh, Rick Yeo just did a video on that talking about how this is, like, the end of... And I'm lightly quoting that, the music as a business, because of the fact that they've brought the value of music down so much to where you, for $10 a month, you get access to everyone's albums, you get to listen to all of them, and the artist doesn't make hardly anything off of it, so the incentive to create and be creative is not there as much as it used to be. Well, I'm... What what would be your guys' views on that? I have a different approach and feeling about that. I feel like, like myself, without a label, you could put out... First of all, I'm a songwriter. I like to create. I like to produce. I like the process of recording and creating. So 
it's enjoyable. And the fact that you can put something out of high of album quality, professional quality, in your home for a budget, for less money than the old days of going to a studio, and then the world can hear it if they choose. You can put it out there, and it may, may not be like a radio hit, but your creative efforts and work gets out into the world and people can enjoy it. Even if it's 10, at least it's 10, yeah. as opposed to it's zero. people, no right. matter what. Yeah. So, and I'm not sure people are doing it for the money to make you know, money from right. music, but we're also out playing. So for us, we get the benefit of making money from playing. So I think you used to be used to go tour to sell a record. Now you put out a record or put out some music so you can tour. That's right. my feeling. So that's a little bit. Of, and, and, and Gerard, you were part of this album too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was working on <clears throat> a few instrumental stuff, and um, Adam liked some of the ideas. I always run right. all my ideas by him anyway. He's been working with him for right. <laughs> 40 years right, now. Right. <laughs> um, and a couple of things inspired him, so he would help, um, you know, either rearrange or, you know, change parts or what have you. And couple of songs made right. his record, which and I then, was really proud of, which and then, was great. But also, Gerard co-produced the whole record because he was, first of all, I always bounced the same thing. I bounced everything off of him just for what's this, help me like edit it and help me as a producer, help me make it just sound right, too long, too short, what about this thing? So I ran everything by Gerard, and he was getting such phenomenal sounds like, in his own studio. I'm like, wow. Could you mix a bunch? And so, he, you know, we just, it, he co-produced everything, mixed a bunch of things. Some, a few people mixed some other things. It was a kind of a group, you know, effort there. But Gerard mixed a bunch of stuff. I mixed a few. Some other guys mixed some stuff, so. And you guys sometimes play the same guitar manufacturer. I remember when we I do. saw you guys. We try and go for the ZZ Top thing. We always try and play it. <laughs> The same we don't color. spin them. Yeah, we don't, yeah. we don't spin them and no furry guitars. You guys just spin your bodies. Right. Yeah, exactly. You guys One just spin them, the guitars. <laughs> yeah, we try to... the drummer, yeah. that was it. No, we always do try to play the same color guitars. And we have a lot of the same brand guitars, too. Yeah. Oh, you guys we are... We were on ESP. We ESP. But back in the day, we had Easy SP. We always had this... We like, if I got a blue guitar, Gerard would get a blue bass. And, right. we, and the same now. If I get a black guitar, he gets a black... Had that pink magenta. Yeah. Right. That, that's he why you were so I into who painted his. You knew the name and everything yeah, out of the yeah, bat. Yeah. You guys were the same people. Right, right. That makes sense. And you guys were doing Landon for a little Correct. bit. You introduced me to about Landon Guitars. Correct. Landon, unfortunately, they sold the company. Um, but they were a company, USA Custom, where they were making necks and bodies, high-end stuff. And then they started to manufacture their own guitars. And that's, I started using USA Custom right when they made that transition and we became endorsed by them. And they made us some phenomenal guitars. And where are they based out of? They were Puyallup, Washington. Exactly. You asked. Okay. There it is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It. Yeah, I can't Don't spell ask it. Do Don't, that. Don't ask me to spell it. <laughs> nice, nice. Right. And you're using the, you guys are using the fractal stuff? I'm using the fractal. Gerard's using the sand. Oh, nice. A okay. little bit base fly rig. It's right. that big. And that's it. That's my whole And Steve so. uses a Helix. So, oh, yeah. so we had three different types of models. That's right. I forgot he plays in one right. And yeah. we do, you know, we, we went speakerless. I used to run it through some cabinets. Then we went speakerless for a while. But now we, we kind of like to put some wedges, get a little ambience on stage. Even though we're on ears, believe it or not, there's something about a little air moving that is important. Yeah, no, definitely. Even if it's not even a side fill, some, some speaker on stage projecting some sound. So it just gives a little bit, of, I don't know, something to it. Yeah, and, and, and what, what kind of speaker cabinet are you guys using for that? Well, I was using mm -hmm. Marshalls. I was just running like a little power amp into Marshalls, but now we can use any wedge or any side field just to get some air yeah. moving. It doesn't so matter. Bit. It's just really ambient. It's not really the tones coming from the fractal direct, mm -hmm. but it's just more for like a presence on stage. <laughs> <laughs> subscribe, please. Hit the subscribe button. Now back to your regular programming. Hey, it's funny. <clears throat> we always do a little rehearsal before the show in the dressing room, and you're playing, is it a Black Star? Yeah. Your amp? Right. And lately, I've just Actually, been plugging... Actually, it's a Boss Katina. Katana. Yeah, Katana. Katana. Yeah. Is that, is that, is that Katana. what it is? Katana? Yeah, yeah. Katina. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> is it a Katina? What, what, is, it? I what is it? I think it's called a Katana, right? Uh, whatever you say. Either <laughs> way. It's Katana. Yeah, that's... Yeah, yeah. Is that what it is? Right? It's well, a, that's what I remember. The Boss the Katana. Okay. Either way, that, <laughs> I love it. It's going to get real confusing. It's over there. So either way. I thought it was after a sword, right? A Katana sword? So, and lately, I've just been plugging in. Craig always gets a little roll in there. Right. Back there. Nice, yeah. And I got to tell you, man, it sounds 
Right. right. Oh, ants have come like, a long way. Ants have yeah. come. A, a practice ants have come a long way. Over to that Fifty-one fifty over there. Iconic. Out of, uh, yeah. He likes that one a lot. It yeah, fit yeah. perfectly in the back of my car. Oh, it's turned off. It's turned it off. That is true. <laughs> we should talk about that kind of stuff too. Okay. I'm always looking for crazy deals. We should talk about this with the gear you guys have too. If you guys have any crazy finds, but I did get a fifty-one fifty iconic, uh, forty watt. So it's not the 15, which I think the 15 is very cool because I think to have a 15 water that small with that kind of footprint it sounds nasty like that. Which one? I'm is interested. That? This is the 40 watt. That's perfect. Whatever you have, that's the that's the that's the magic now it's 350 one. with the manual. You gotta that's just keep amazing. your eyes out there. Is there any crazy deals you guys got on gear before like that? You know, I'm sorry to say no. <laughs> <laughs> I not wish bargain I did. hunters, are you? <laughs> no, I, I, I try. No, I try. I don't get them. I, I somehow get it the other direction. I get it marked up. I don't know what happens. Oh yeah. <laughs> But I, I actually would like, a, I actually am looking for, to find either like a 5150 or a Saldano or a Friedman. I, I want a good old fashioned in my house tube head, just the way you have it, just to plug into. It sounds so great. I'm not sure I want to lug it out on the road, but I do want to have it in my studio. Just, it does inspire you. That sound is so great. So. Right, exactly. And that's, that's just a 40 water. That's all you I need. Mean, that's what do you need like, up here? What more do you yeah, need? Yeah, it's great. So I, I agree with that. And what are your thoughts on the Sam Hill cab we got here? This big old wall. You know, sound. it's pretty. It's a little, not. It's a little bottom endy for my taste. I like that. But he oh, likes right. that. Of course, I like that. Right, right. Bass right. player. He's right. digging it. It's That's got right. A Fifteen inch in right. there. Yeah, right. fifteen inch on the bottom. Right. Two twelves. When you plugged in that baritone <laughs> so guitar, it shook, that shook the whole place. <laughs> it did. <laughs> yep. This is my favorite cab. I went to his house. He's out here. He's a uh, English amp cab builder. Cab builder, and right. his cabs are just. He has a science to his cabs. Okay. It's not like. He broke it down for me, and just there's literally mathematical equations to where the sound comes right, out, where it hits you, and he's mastered it. So I went to his house, he pulled me to every single cab. Oh, wow. Then we got to this one. I go, and I plugged my Kemper, I was using my Kemper. Right. I was hearing nuances in my Kemper patches. Well, your Kemper has power? Yes, oh, and okay. I've never heard these files like that right. until I got in that cab. Well, you know what, it makes so, it, when you plug it into an amp, it does bring, again, the same I was saying before, when you go through a speaker, it does bring some different things. Even with the modeling through a speaker, the motion of the air, yeah. there's something to it. It's not, I mean, it's, listen, I love it on my in-ears, don't get me wrong, I'm not, and also the convenience is phenomenal, but you need to move some air. Yeah, and you guys never saw the one that I, uh, we did together. It was a, um, you ever seen the Van Halen? Person. I didn't see it in person. It's a Super Halen cabinet and head we, we created. Right. So it was a custom one by 12. We took the mini Saldano Slows 30s they put right. out. We wrapped the entire thing in vintage 1990 Van Halen comic books. Wow. wow. I have a batch, the last right. remaining batch of about 200 to 300. And it's just enough to make 50 amps. And what did you cover? And we covered the top and bottom and they look stellar. It's okay. incredible. And you know what the funny thing is? We took it to the Amigo Guitar Show. Right. And the majority of people came up to us were wives that wanted it for their house and oh, wanted the so husband well. to buy it for the house that's decor, so cool. not to be played for decor. So when we did the Phil X Master Class, it sold. Oh, nice! I got married after who was attending the class and wanted it. So that one went, but I should I would have had another one in here, but I'm not gonna have a time. But it's little stuff like that I like. But um, getting back at it, yeah, that was my best find that's for the money. That's a good one. Um, but you're right. I think. A good tube amp is necessary. Just if you don't, you don't have to, don't have to take it out. No right, one's doing no, it anymore, I need, really. I need, anyway. Right, correct. But just to have in your pad, hundred percent. But that your studio, combo, I think that thing, like we were in Guitar Center that day. That I plugged into that amp a few times. Yeah. And I'm always like, wow, that crunch is it. And that was during the uh, what was that gig at? That was the uh, that was Christmas a private gig, party. Yeah, a private, private party. party. Yeah. That was, <laughs> I remember that. That was a good one. We, that was, we've done that a few times. Yeah, but that was a fun. Do you remember that one? I do. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Do you remember how great that one was yeah. when the AC broke in? In the ballroom? Oh, oh shit, God. yes. <laughs> it was yes, a scorcher. Yes. So, Correct. I forgot about that. Yes. Yeah, that was that was fun times, though. And that was a great guitar string I went to, too. It was. I found some crazy deals there. And you would never think that this guitar string, this, at the time, it was a very smaller area in Port St. Lucie. Right. There's really not a whole lot out there other than right. like that and a little shopping center. But I was finding crazy guitars getting brought and used. Right. That I was scoring crazy deals on in that you have to place. to take us to Franklin Guitar Works. That's where we have to go. I know. Unfortunately, they closed in four. I know. I know. So we missed them. But next time. <laughs> you got delayed. You got delayed. My, my fault. But next time, yes. And they are yeah. open tomorrow. Okay. And they open at 7 o'clock in the morning, 7.30. So if you're an earlier morning person okay. you want to do it, we could probably make it happen. Wow. wow. So I'll give you guys a tour of that place. They okay. have bases, too. 7 a.m. Are you serious? Yeah, okay, we can I can pick you up the, and go if you want to. We can do it. Yes, I'm in. Okay. It'll be a lot of fun. Um, so, yes, very true. So let's talk about the tracks. And before we go into that, something else I want to talk about with you uh -oh. guys. Okay? Because I found this, but I didn't send it to you guys. PSA? 
Is it D Adario or D Adario? Well, no, I can't Both. even comment. Both? Okay. Katina yes. Good. Now that's Katina, out of the way. Katina Katana. Because because uh, that's also got a little bit no, of controversy. Wolf, well, say, say Wolfgang I said it's to, something I always else. called it Dario. Dario. As opposed to a D Adario. Yeah. I think it's D Adario. It's, okay. no, there's no there's no D. We always said the Dario. Okay. They're from they're on one. Yeah. Right. Well, you, that makes sense because you guys were featured we were. in their Young Guns 2 we advertisement. Were. We were. I remember that. I got a picture of that. We're going to put it right up in yes, this video. Yes, yes, <laughs> That's I, right. I, that was like our first, I think that was the first ad we ever did. It was pretty cool. Right? Yeah. That's pretty cool. It's funny. I saw that Bon Jovi documentary and I was actually pretty impressed by it. And when he talks about when he wrote Young Guns, because he said they came to him, they wanted wanted their role. He's like, fuck that. I'll write, I'll write a song myself right. right from the beginning right it was pretty good because he was getting a lot of shit about co-writers and yes all that time. stuff so it was and cool. he really shoved it back at him i mean look at the success exactly. of that song yeah exactly right Great. it's he's, like you know after watching that i brought that up to fill the interview well it was a master class we did but i interviewed right. him for it and i said people said that john shanks brought you in to take over for richie sambor and that's why you got in that gig i said what people don't know if you watch a documentary you'll see actually you won't see it there I did some research, real in-depth. There was an Elton John tribute album that came out in like 1991. Right. And they brought in John Bon Jovi to come in and play. And Phil X was playing for Aldo Nova, or I believe it was Triumph at the time. Right. They called him in. And he played on the album on the track with John. I because see. John got rid of the guitar player that was brought in. And he brought in Tico on drums. And they brought in Phil. Oh, I see. And Phil stayed because he could hang with the rest of the band. I see. And he rated a song with him covering an Elton John song. Huh. And I brought this up. He goes, okay, yes, that's true. We go back that right. far. Okay, that's but cool. he said, think of all the people he met. Right. There's a slim chance he ever remembers that happening. Right. But Phil told me the story. He's like, yeah, yeah that's, he, that's a cool story. in the studio and John right. gave like one of the guys the keys to his Ferrari. He said, you take around and go out for the guys and hang out with his car and shit while he's in the studio oh, wow. recording. So the, technically they were together decades before. All right, that's so cool. So they did meet that. each other. Yeah, but it's a good fit. I think Phil I only looked into that after I watched that documentary because it is a really good fit. documentary. I'm like, yeah, Richie Sambor really is the real thing and he's, you know, the, the original guy but if you have to, if he's not going to be there, Phil is, you know, Phil's phenomenal. Yeah, he knocks it out of the park. He definitely does. So, let's go into some of the tracks on Rapture. Sure. Okay, now you did ask me to play on that song. Yes. And I made you sweat it out for almost a year getting you no, that wasn't on purpose, getting you that solo, okay? <laughs> oh, we were swamped. We were going in and out, That's moving right. there, moving here. I don't here. remember, but okay, if you say and so. And it took a little while. I'm okay. like, oh, I don't remember. Kill me. It's our, no, not, I think I started writing that when I was in Orlando. It's and I wrote the majority of it, like, within an hour. And then I just, it was just put on the back work. So we had to do all this moving stuff. It's it took all good. forever. I don't remember any of that, so it's all good. But, yeah, so I, I did that solo, and the track was? Up the Hill. Up the Hill, That's right. And that was a track that Gerard originated and sent me some, the introduction, and all the loops and stuff, and I put, I kind of put this Duran Duran melody to it. What's that song? Uh, Ordinary, Ordinary Life? Life. Yeah, or, I kind of was, I don't know why, it had this real open melody, but then the middle part, the middle solo section didn't have anything, or Gerard had, actually I take that back, Gerard had another section that I hacked up into like, believe it or not, a real D, a, a, no, a real Dio kind of vibe, like, oh, you oh, know, right, right, right. I really was thinking like that, the way like, um, Last in line, or like um, Holy Diver, like those solo breaks where they're down, like it's, yeah. there's a stop. I had that. I had Vivian Campbell in mind. Wow, I can hear that. Yeah, it's, it's, and that real like just I don't know. It was in B. I don't know something about it. Just I don't know. I went for that Dio thing. Hell yeah, it's, it's a it's a killer track. It was it was easy to go over and uh, write write a solo over Thank that, you. which. It was a lot of fun. And we, have, we have a lot of questions, so I don't know if you want to get into that now, but we'll wait till uh -oh. we get a guitar for you. We have some oh questions gosh. on what the hell you played. I'll have to plug that in. You do. Figure that one we're out. Making, making definitely play. Buckethead, John Five inspired craziness. Well, it's, all, it's all good. Because <laughs> I just didn't want to... Well, we'll get into that. Yes, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll come back to this. We're going to come back to that. But, okay, so you guys have lived this life in this industry for a very long time, decades. You have seen trends come and go. Correct. You have interacted with some of the top players in the world, you guys were side by side with these guys, right? And you're still performing at a top tier level. What are some, what are some crazy, like interactions you guys had over the years? With, uh, well, Ger you know, actually, Gerard, no, 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 no. I'm gonna give Gerard, yeah, Gerard. Gerard has one of the best because we talked about Ali Shitty, so I can bring it back up again. Gerard, Ali Shitty was friends with Valerie Bertinelli, and Gerard used to go hang out at 5150. Really. All right, so I'll tell you this story. This is the best one. So earlier I mentioned I got 
the book that Steve Rosen wrote. Yeah. And I promised him once I finished it, I would tell him a very unique Eddie Van Halen story that he probably doesn't even know. So now he'll hear We're gonna it hear? first. Yeah. Yes. So, <clears throat> yes, Ali was very good friends of Valerie Burton. Ali, I assume they still are. I don't know. And we got invited to go to their house. Um, and before we were leaving... Is this, hold on. Is this pre-cell phone? Well, this is... Oh, yeah. yeah it had so, to be. Right, right. 90, Gerard, 1990. I remember Gerard okay. called me saying, like, holy shit, I'm going to, like... I'm like, what? You know? Well, <laughs> but the, the crazy <laughs> part of the story. So, Ali, we were up in Malibu. We were going to drive down. And we're <clears throat> leaving the house... And a bird flies into the window of the house. And we're like, what the heck was that? And we go outside, and this, this bird is on the ground. And I'm like, Ali, I think he's dead, you know? I'm, no, 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 we have to take the bird with us. You know, we're gonna, we'll find a vet or something, That's right? And she loved animals. We had rabbits, all kinds of crazy stuff. So <clears throat> she gets a box, a towel, has the bird in the towel in the car, from Malibu all the way down to where they live in the canyon. And we're looking, and you're right, there were no cell phones, so we couldn't, like, start calling vets. We can't find anything that's open, anything we pass. So we finally pull up to the house, and there's a gate, and he's, you know, they, he's got to buzz us in. Now, I'm excited. I had never met Eddie. And obviously he was, a, he was an idol of mine, right? Right. Like, right. Man, that's crazy. And I'm, I never get really starstruck. I met a ton of people. But Eddie is like Eddie, right? <clears throat> so we pull up, and he opens the front door. He's at the front door, and we're like in the driveway. And I remember this. He didn't have shoes on, jeans. And he opens the door and says, hey, what's going on? And Allie gets out of the car, and she goes... This bird got hurt. We got. We're still trying to figure out. Too. He's like, "What?" And I mean, the second I we get like right near him, the friggin' bird wakes up and flies right into the friggin' house, <gasps> and he's flapping around. <laughs> and I'm like, "Holy God, what is going on?" And he's going crazy. So you know? And Valerie's pregnant as can be, and. I don't know. I think he got a broom or something. We somehow shooed the thing out of the house. It was the craziest wow. thing. So that's how the day started. Thank you for bringing this over. And the bird is now fine, flies wow. away. So anyway, we were hanging out. And it was a blast for me because, first of all, it was great to meet Valerie. I had never met her. She's literally like nine months pregnant at that point. And I was like, yeah, what are you naming the baby? She goes, Wolfgang. I'm like, Wolfgang? <laughs> I go, you're Italian. She goes, I know, I know, but she goes, Eddie's family. But I was like, hey, that's pretty cool. And we were watching, I'll never forget, the Jets were playing. I don't know if they were in the playoffs because Mark Gastineau was playing, right, right, right. which is a whole nother story. Gastineau was right, living right. with someone behind our good friend Steve Hoffman. And what was her name? His girlfriend at the time? The actress from Rocky. Rocky IV, the blonde. Oh, oh, gosh. You remember how Tanya Dude. Does? You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, you're talking about uh, she was on Bridget something. Bridget Nielsen, right? She was on Bridget Solar Nielsen. Rehab. Anyway, Bridget Nielsen <laughs> had a dress <laughs> in our friend Steve yeah. Hoffman's closet. It's a whole other story. Anyway, which, which, I think I was wrong that. I don't think it was not celebrity rehab. I think it was uh, the surreal life on VH1. Surreal life. So we were watching the jet game, blah blah blah. Jet and then and then he goes, You wanna go check out the studio? And I'm like, Yeah. Yeah, it's of course. So he takes me, we walk out through Crazy, his right? garage. Wow. And I'll never forget it. She had, there was a beautiful green Jag there. He said, that's Valerie's. I'm like, that car's great. And he had this Maserati truck at the time. And it looked like, almost like what a Hummer would look like. Really? And I, I go, man, what did that thing run you? And he thought I said, what does it run? He goes, it does like 120 in the dirt. <laughs> <laughs> that's what he really? said. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> like, whatever. So he brings me up to 5150, and, and I was mind blown. It was just him and I we were hanging out, show me the whole studio, and then he takes me. He had a room kind of like this because it was on top of his other garage. Yeah. Evidently, I guess they had owned the house next to it, and then, anyway, this was so many years ago. 
But he brought me up, and he had, I guess, his, like his workshop and all his guitars. And, man, he starts pulling out guitars, and he pulled out the original. Frank and Frank and right. like yeah. Frank and, and I'm like, and that's when I said, man, I wish Adam was here, because this is beyond surreal. It's insane. Right? It's totally surreal. Him and Eddie and all his guitars, and he's showing them everything. And, and and this was so 1990. 90. Right. Yeah. yeah, 1990. So technically, I think he was, was he, he was with Music Man at that time, right, Ernie Ball? Or they had not done that uh, yet. He took the Kramers into like 1990, 91, right? Yeah, I think this was bef right was before, before he that, went yeah. into the Kramers. I think so. It was before Ernie Ball. It was, was Music Man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's still it was the 84 no, it was Kramer. Hockey, hockey stick. Yeah, yeah so it's still so the it was Kramers. Definitely, yeah. It was the Kramer of Berettas. Okay. So, wow. <clears throat> anyway, blah, blah, blah. We hang out. It was great. And we go back in the house. He goes, let me show you something really cool. And I swear to God, we're in his family, in the den. And he, he walks toward the fireplace and opens a door like you couldn't tell. And there's a full court, racquetball court in the house. Through the fireplace. Through next to the fireplace. Okay. And you walk in. But sitting on a stand is an acoustic guitar. In the middle of this racquetball court. I'm like, what the hell's going on? He goes, you got to check this out, man. He goes, you know, I've recorded everywhere mobile trucks. I built this friggin' racquetball court. It's the best natural reverb I've ever heard in my life. And he starts playing. And I'm in there. And it was a song that ended up on the next album because I remembered it years later. I don't even know what it was now. And I was like, this is just so surreal. Like, it's me, him, and now yeah. he's playing this new piece just so we can hear reverb in a racquetball court that's in his house. <laughs> like, the whole thing was... It's a good story, right? And that was, was crazy. And that would have been... Gosh, now I'm going to have to probably edit this out because the Van Halen fanatics are going to chew me down. Yeah, was it for unlawful carnal knowledge? I don't know. I don't because that know. was when he was with Music Man. So that was... That was that came out after your visit. Right. Was it 316 he played? I don't know. Slow piece, just instrumental? It was slow. We'll find, we'll find, we'll it was an acoustic it, piece. And we'll find, you'll play the piece. But I, I'm almost... Positive was on the next album. Right so he played that in the racquetball. Yeah, court. he was Him and Drew like he was noodling and. Do you remember what kind of acoustic guitar it was? I don't. No. I'm not a gearhead. Oh. Admittedly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. This is the wrong show for me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Damn, that is so wild. But it was crazy. So. Wow, that's a great story. Yeah. yeah. No, that we had. I was it was crazy. Shit, I, was, I I drilled Drew on. I'm like, what was I say? I'm like, what happened? This? What was this? He's like, I don't know. I'm like, what? What I would have done for a cell phone then, I just I would have just FaceTimed. Right. I know, but no, I it was cool that the cool part Eddie was, was cool as shit. Like he would have totally. But the cool part was that I answered any questions. The part that the fact that it just happened naturally, no fan thing. It's just like, hey, you at the house? Let's check it out. It's pretty cool. Yeah, he invited. Yeah, he was like, you want to go check? It? I'm like, yeah. Dude, uh, I've heard similar stories to that where they go over his house with guys like Steve Brown. Yeah. He would talk about right. that. They would go to the beach with Wolfgang, who was just born, and it was around the same time. Right. And it then been right around that. It seemed sure. like I heard that uh, in the late 90s and then earlier, the early 2000s, he kind of became distant from everybody, which I right. think leads into that time with the Sammy Hagar reunited tour with Sammy. And then well, they had like. He talks about that in the book, Rosen. I thought, I thought he got diagnosed in 2000. That's what he, Steve right. Rosen wrote. Right. With so, cancer and he was having marital issues. So that's probably why he got Right. My, my, uh, my, bug, my uh, good buddy was, a, he, he still is, he's a uh, private pilot. Big shout out to Ray there. And uh, Ray was telling me that he flew at Van Halen at the airport during that time. He saw him in front of him. He goes, dude, you're Eddie Van Halen? He goes, yeah. And he was flying the band. And Eddie, I believe, took a, a separate jet. Hmm. Sammy and the rest of the band had their own jet. Eddie took his own jet. Hmm. All right. It's they had that kind of budget. It's crazy, right? So he, he, he had to get just his own plane. But that was during that time. I'm like, you lucky bastard. You met him. Wild. Crazy yeah. stuff. That's a, that's a hell of a story there, huh? That's a, right, that's yeah. a good one. That's a good story. See, get any more of those you guys want to throw out there, throw out there, and you know I'll turn into about 10 different videos. <laughs> I guess, you know, I mean, just, again, watching just from a guitar point of view, like I mentioned earlier, getting to watch Nuno like a million times from side stage or just like hanging out amazing. was always like, you know, it was always just, I mean, as a guitar player, just mind-blowing. The guy was just flawless. It was always like amazing how, I'm like, God, there's not even a bad note. So I on New Year's when we went to see them in Boston with Hoff before no. he signed them? No. So Steve Hoffman, dear friend of ours who passed away young, he actually had gotten them signed <clears throat> to the management company that, that um, we were also signed to. And his brother, Robbie, now manages I was going to say Robbie that. Hoffman, Robbie's really yeah, Robbie? Okay. Who's also a dear friend of ours. But he took a... I went with 
him. Robbie was up at school there because Robbie was roommates with Pat Badger, I think, at, right. at Berkeley or whatever. Wow. And I just remember being blown away. And to this day, they're probably my favorite band as a fan to watch live. And I just, like, I'm, like, a fan. Right. Like, I'm, I'm friends with these guys. I love them. But, like, I am a fan, like, full on. Like, I love watching them play. Is that incredible? It's amazing. See, for me, it was always, I'm from South Florida, so Fort Lauderdale, what was so big down that area downtown was New River Studios. New River is where they did Three Sides to Every Story. Oh, that's, right. Right. that's also where Skid Row did Slave to the Grind. Oh. That's where Michael Jackson recorded stuff. So for me, I mean, I literally grew up in that area going through there wanting to see, and it's always locked up the studio. It's all that's gone all now. Right. It's, you know, it's something else. Right. Yeah, so that's all, that's all, you know, over now. But that's why when I actually first interviewed Nuno you know, in like 2018, right. I brought that up to him that's about that studio. It's like, oh, I think I remember that a little bit. But it's so crazy. So I got to ask you guys, having grown up with them, been fans, right? Mm -hmm. How did you react when you saw the massive success? And how strange was it to see, decades later, the amount of acknowledgement that went to Extreme on their last album, Six, and Nuno, right. win that solo, blow up, and be the guitar player of the year? Did you, could you ever saw that coming so many years no, later? But I, personally, I feel they deserve that and 10 times more than that. They, they were just that great a band and, and right? still are. Like, and you they, think they, they, that, they right? have earned and deserved Everything, and like I said, I, I was surprised they weren't, you know, as big as Jovi or anyone else, right. you know. Well, I think but what was cool, like, you know, I think time does a great thing. You know, time had passed, and he is that good. People were excited to see them reunite, like, really put out a new record. And it, was a, it wasn't just like a record. It was a great record. It really was a good record. It is a great record, not was. It's a great record. So, and we mentioned Robbie Hoffman, who's our dear friend. You know, we got all the behind the scenes. We knew what was going on, but... And, but who knew, like, it was going to explode like that, you know? But they're smart guys. I mean, Nuno did all those videos himself. I think he's just yeah. so... Yeah, he listen, plans them all. Like, you know what? He reminds me of Prince, almost. Like, the way he's he's just so multifaceted, right. yeah. talented. It's insane. Right. It's a good, yeah. good observation. Yeah. So, but it was, so it wasn't surprising. It was, it was nice to see it because, it's first of all, it's cool that he is that good. You know, plus he just... I think when he played with... Rihanna, believe it or not, he was always known in the guitar world, but that put him like, it made him a bigger celebrity, like outside of the guitar world, because he was like on a different platform. And then the Generation X thing, like, so he, you could tell there was momentum, like, even though he was huge in his own right in the 80s and 90s, he almost became more popular, I think, through the time, as time went on. And then that record came out and just was like, holy shit, and Rise just was like, what the hell is he even doing? And people were excited about it. So looking back, it seems like a great momentum. Now they're touring, they're playing like you know, stadiums in Europe. It's, it's just great. Right. They, they, they're well deserved now. We're, I think we're fans. So That's so crazy. I remember I was talking to Robbie, and he was, this must have been 2021. Right. 2020. He sent me a text of a crazy Washburn N4, the custom shot made for him in oh, white. He has it. Yeah, Robbie. It's has all it. relic. It's wild. Oh, my I, dude. I that, that is guitar. stunning. Yeah, it's, uh, so it's totally all you. We'll get, we'll get, we'll get I it. immediately <laughs> asked him, how much did you pay and could I get a deal if I could right, have the right, Bible right, one? Because I would totally do it. You know what's cool? Those, I like those Nellies, too. Those Wash Brown Dude, the Nellies don't get enough love. They don't get You know, we're already talking about them. What's well, interesting I mean, is you know, know? they don't sell more. And how is the N4 not more popular even for sale? Dude, that's a uh, that's know. a big fact too. That well, and, okay, I'm, and I'm, I'm another one things. too is the uh, the N24. People don't give that enough credit. That's that? the import model right. that uh, is basically identical. It has a Stevenson cutaway. Right. And there was a time when I first interviewed Nuno. You know, I said, well, "Don't we all talk about the N24?" And he goes, "What the hell is that?" I said, "Well, that's the import model of your guitar, right. but it's very high up there. It's not the N2. It's right. the N you know N24. It's much better." So I, said, I gotta look at that up. And you know, how do you, you know, I always ask Robbie about guitar geek <laughs> stuff. He only plays that. Like, oh, you, you, yeah. He did like a rig rundown. He plays like one guitar, man. Yeah. Like, it's mind blowing. You know what? You know what I actually bought? Like, I must have been like ten years ago, or like maybe almost fifteen years ago now. I went to Guitar Center. I said I want an acoustic guitar. Let's. I want to finally get right. one. I never. I started with the electric. People say you got to start with acoustic. I don't believe that. Just give me electric. I'm good. So I had that for the longest time. But I said I want something that feels like an electric. Right. So I pointed this guitar on the wall. And it? go go figure. It was a brand new Washburn Nuno Betancourt signature acoustic. Oh, that black one? No. What was it? It was a wood one. And it has his oh, logos I, I all have... over the sound hole. Really? And on the fretboard. I picked it up. 
can you can shred on it. I got it in the living room. Oh, wow. I have a wash, bro. I yeah, but not that one. I've never seen that yeah, one. That's cool. Like, yes, yeah. the one you're talking about is the black one yeah. that he still uses, but he had a signature acoustic guitar. Oh, wow. And it's, it's a weird time. It's on the same time that Steve I had a signature Ibanez acoustic that was all green with a tree of life on it. Wow. It was called like the oh, e yeah, Evor or here. something. And John Five had a signature acoustic guitar, I believe, too. Yeah, I want Crazy a crap. You never guitar. hear about that. But those guys had acoustic signatures. That's so wild. Um, but uh, that's that's pretty sick. Yeah, that's because uh, we just interviewed them again. I'm thinking the Monsters of Rock cruise, not last year, but the year prior. Then we went and saw them right. out here, and that and was. And you know, hurt his one. knee. I remember that. I'm so shocked. He's, he's he did shocked right. and flattered that he showed up to that interview. Because I was telling Sarah, I said, whatever. Right. I don't hold it against right. him. He I wouldn't show would up, and I totally get it. He blew it out, but he showed up on crutches. That's mad respect there. That I'm like, good dude, time. that's uh, you're the guy, man. You're the man. honored. You're the I really appreciate shred, it. Dude. Great interview too. It was. <laughs> so uh, very cool. So you guys want to ask me some questions? I can well, help you. We want to go. We want to get. Let's. Let's. We need to get pick up some guitars. We have some questions for you on okay. the solos. Yeah, I would look at this camera for okay. the talking, okay. and then whenever you guys want to sauce up things. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Hello, everybody. So, this is a continuation to our. Talking, what's it? What's it? Talking shred. It's a talking shred. Talking shred. So as we were talking earlier, we I came out with a solo record. It's called Rapture. There's a song called Up the Hill. I invited Derek to play a solo. It's a solo section that we're going to hear before we learn about the solo. I said, do whatever you want. Here's the track. Go nuts. He said, okay. So we're going to hear that now. Cue that. So the question, Gerard and I were always, we've been talking, we put the track into the, you know, the session, it sounds great, but what the hell are you doing, man? It's so cool, there's clearly some effects happening, there's tapping, there's octaves, there's a lot going on, so you can do it slowly, but break us down, walk us through what you did on that solo, okay. please, Well, here's, Mr. Shred. Here's the tricky part with this, too, is that you're already a phenomenal player, so you give me this track, and you ask me to play on it, so A, thank you, flattered, you guys asked me to do that. The tough part is, is that how do you respond to your playing that's already on the track? My view of that was to do something completely different Understood. than your style of playing. That's cool. So where you can kind of tell there was a change. Clearly, some weird person just stepped into this track, right? right? And you may want to go read the CD you know, pamphlet to see who the hell is this? Because it's right. not Adam doing this. Right, right. I didn't want to kind of blend it. I kind of want to stand out, but still... Pay respect to the song. Understood. I didn't want you it did to, you, did perfect. you know, so I just want to make it sound different. You so did. a big part of that is the Digitech Whammy pedal. Look at that angle going too, which is great. Yeah, you got all these over here. Okay, that's better. Here we go. Okay, I need you to go. Okay. 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 So. so you were I lost, we lost. Paid respect. Oh, yeah. To be different. Right, okay. Yes. So this was, uh, we wanted to be different. So I wanted to use as, as not as many tools as I could get that right. were different. But I wanted to utilize some different things, kind of go into every bag of trick I have to make it just different enough. Understood. But again, something to where, and I hope it didn't come across it like, you never want people to say, wow, this does not belong here. To a degree, I do want them to say, well, this is definitely different, right. but I want it to be fitting. So I thought it was fitting. So we, thank we, you. we didn't even question. We're like, okay. we dropped it right in. It sounded great. <laughs> so we cued it and it went. And that was written. I did that in Orlando when I was still living there. And Sarah, you actually got a video of me too, uh, playing it when I was practicing at night through the mini Black Star 100 here yes, I did. with all the effects on it with this guitar, with this guitar, Very cool. going through how we're going to get this little simulation right. Because I knew how I wanted to do it, but I'm not one for nip for I was using. <laughs> no, she really was like, oh my gosh, I know I feel God terrible. It's last time you ever asked me to do shit for his songs. So it was, <laughs> I'm happy we got it. It was a little tricky to, to make it work because I knew what it wanted to sound like. But um, yeah, that was a big tool in doing that song. And, so, um, and then, so what, did you use an amp? What did you use? 
I, you know what? I'm trying to think if I camera. mic'd the amp at all. I may have used the Black Star and mic'd right. uh, the Black Star to get that, but I think if it wasn't that, then it was STL Tones in oh, the games cool. pack. The plugin. Awesome. Yeah, the plugins that does make life really easy it when does. you're recording. Sounds great. The good, cool thing is about all these amps now, even like the 5150s. I know the Black Stars are doing it. You can plug them directly in I as know. interfaces and that get the entire cool. thing on your computer. So right. it's like you can run your head technically. It will right. sound phenomenal. Um, but it was primarily using that, but it was tricky to get the parts because as I was trying to do one solid take for that solo, it took forever. You can, it really you can punch into it, you know, it's all right, you can digital recording. I couldn't because okay. I always come in too late or too, too, too early and it always sounds like shit. I had to do one take okay. to get it straight wow, through. Good for you, buddy. And when you got to worry about the effect like right, that, right. With the, with the, with that did check with me. If you don't get the first intro right, I got you, I got you. or you get that and then that whole chromatic thing comes right. up and you mess that up, you gotta go right back to the beginning. So walk us through it slowly. Tell us about this pedal. So, yes, yeah, so this is my uh, Digitech Whammy pedal, which will pop up on the screen here. Yes. So I use the down tuner one, um, just because it's easier. So you have the down tune option, where you can go down a shit ton. And then, of course, you have your uh, Whammy. Um, but for the Whammy, I'm using the two octave up. So I can go two full octaves on this thing to get right. the crazy, like, Morello bucket head type effects. Right, right. Definitely um, has Tom Morello feel in there, which is cool. Right, right. And there's it is it's tricky again too because you want to get that nice gradual sweep. Sometimes right. you just go way too far forward. Right. Which you'll probably see as I start playing this, go way too far forward or or not enough. Um, but definitely a good tool to make it different slightly. So, so we just heard the recorded track. So just play it slowly. Pl show me what you played. Okay. Okay. So okay. edit. Edit that. Get my foot over here. Okay. Let's see. So that thing comes in. I'm doing this on a pile of books. Okay. So. Hey, that was the part. Something. Wow, that's perfect. Oh, wow. There's no. this, this, I didn't play this in a while. That's some hiccups there. No, but that that's, was, that's, uh, but that's the vibe. So you did. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so tell me. Up. Besides up the, the hill. So, next question. Besides the, the, the awesome. So three, right, so three times in that solo, you do that crazy octave thing, which we're like, how the hell is he doing that? Awesome. But show me that chromatic tapping. So the chromatic tapping was actually with this pedal. And then I just don't use it because I got 24 right. fretter. And I recorded right. that. Not on this guitar, but on my Telecaster's 22 frets. Ah. So you, I'm just kind of going with it. Right. But it was supposed to be something that was... Wait, how, I don't remember how that solo goes. Where did the part go, Ben? Uh, I don't know. You did some crazy... Okay. Yeah, man, that's it. That's it. That's it. That's how it goes. Okay, so okay. that, I thought you Me used too. the pedal with... That's Exa exactly. Like bending. So, exactly right. That's what we were saying. We thought I it was a bar. Use, okay. I thought it was so, a bar. I'm like, how's he tapping on using a bar? He must be using a pedal. I did use the pedal for the recorded version. I did, I do believe. And I think I recorded that video but doing it. But what you just do right this right. second? I use my fingers. I didn't, so that's I didn't no, but how are you getting it to sound like it's Just tapping, like he's chromatic bad. tapping. Oh, yeah. Okay. He's bending and tapping at the same time and chromatically so tapping. So I'm going chromatic with this one, but I'm also going down here. But when I was doing it, I was using the pedal. So I would actually go chromatic and just hold it here. And then I would hit the pedal, okay, and this would do my rest of my There's finger two ways work. two to do it. I got gotcha. you. And then it would come down, and I would go like that. Right. So it was a follow-through to a degree. Sounds better when you play it like that. Now, yeah. today. I like it this way better. Right. Yeah. It's more controllable. The Sounds other one, again, if you hit the sweep too early, too late, you're going to miss it. It doesn't sound like shit. Right. So... 24 frets hits it a lot better. Right. Um, and uh, that was a tricky part, too, because it's easy to play this shit fast. Right, exactly. Harder to play it slow. It so when you get down, you, you I start missing what the hell I'm even playing. I'm like, was I playing again? It's like, it's hard to do it. I know. So, uh, yeah, that was, now I do it because I have 24 frets, and I, I wasn't using this guitar for some reason. I was using the I Telecaster back here, which I can pull out, too. It's only cool. 22. But, yeah. I mean, have cats done that in the past? Like, I, that sounds so original. I agree. I, I, I thought I, I thought I was. I thought it was just a, a 
on the bar. Right. right. I wasn't sure if it was a pedal at the bar. I knew something. I knew. I knew you used <laughs> yeah. the pedal because you. Yeah. So okay. Just you. Okay. Uh, Turn my bar off. So that's off. Off. Okay. Okay. So it's just awesome. a, it's just a pattern, it's awesome. but that's great. chromatic. But then I just walk the scale. It's great. It's yeah, very cool. Something like that. Very cool, man. So it's, it's a little circusy. That's great. It's a we, weird, love, we love it, man. <laughs> weird circusy shit. So but thank you for adding to that track. You I mean so it was a little. It you, was, brought, it was, you, you brought it up, and that's awesome. I'm, I'm happy you liked it. I, I was really it, worried about that. I've I'm seen like, guys do like get a whammy effect with that. When you know, what right? I'm doing and you know, right. I've, I've never seen well, I'm honored. I wish there was a method behind it. There really is nothing. It's just playing around over the backing tracks and just figuring out what my fingers can come up I with. I think some it was cool because it was it definitely contrasted what I did and like so it stands out. Like wow, it's like, it's so cool. Plus, I don't use a bar or a pedal, so it was so it's so drastically right. different than what I did. That was cool. That's what I wanted to do because yeah. you know what I also tried not to do too. I did not want to listen to uh, too much. Of your right. playing before that part, so I listened to just enough, right. and then I stopped. I said, "Okay, right. I'm going to go right to the segment I have to be at because right. if I start listening to you, yeah, right. I will question honest. everything yeah. I do, right, right, and right, I'm right, going right. to want this sound exactly like exactly. yours. I will right. tell you what happened. That's how usually how that works. A great job. So I'm like, I don't want to hear, it, but hopefully it blends in. So. It sounds great, man. Right. It's a little wild. All right, so that. now I'm going to we're going to play my little piece, which will be here. I tried to really, ch I told you, I channeled that like Holy Diver, you know, Last in Line, those, those Vivian Campbell yeah. you know, stop breaks where the, so the band stops and the band and the guitar is like, Wah, really? So the first part of the solo, which I use a, a wah wah, but I don't have it here. I want to just full on. I, I recorded mine in pieces because, you know, each one pans back and forth. So the first piece was just a good old tribute to Vivian. You know, the real. Then I attribute the second piece to, I don't know, I think it's Jason Hug. <laughs> Something like that. So much going on there. Just, I kind of went like, you know, it's a little bit of um, Spanish Fly with some Jason Hug. Yeah, then this next part of the solo, where I, you know, I do a little deconstructed. A deconstructed pentatonic, which is a, uh, I learned that from Andy Woods. So I got, I got, I got, I got, The last piece is a tribute to Mr. Bettencourt. Oh, yeah. A little like, I don't know, somewhere in one of his songs, that, that diminished run. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And the underlying thing is... Dude, that sounds... I'm getting Lynch vibes from that. Yeah, from definitely that a flat, well, the flat five, but, you know, again, that's the... When you hear a flat five... I love the flat five. You always think of George Lynch. He's, right. he, he's the one that put that on the map. But that, and that break was definitely a, a Vivian Campbell, like, sort of homage, so...
That sounds killer. Thanks. That is so good, dude. For the two combined, I loved it. I think you did it. I gotta tell you, I was recently turned on to River Dogs. Yeah, oh my god. Brilliant. His Dogs. playing is insane. Yeah. yeah. All over that first album. Yeah. I mean, like, so creative. It, you could. It's all different sections. That was like a 90s yeah. Thing, like every song. That? That's so like early 90s, right? Yeah. Early, early night, because he was Man. in Death Love soon after. Right, right. Like, wait, well, he was in Death Love like '93. Yeah. '93. That's when he had his uh, Tom Anderson guitar. Right, right? exactly. Nice. Yeah. You know what? We were recording Open Skies, and I remember seeing that Queen. That's when they first played with him, the Queen uh, Freddie Mercury tribute. Oh, we were there. No, 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 no. no. I'm sorry. We were at the Queen Mary album release party. Oh, That's okay. what I was thinking of. No. All right, man. Well, listen. No, to but you were talking about that Queen <laughs> where, right. where, where. Extreme players. Extreme yeah, was amazing. That's when Def Leppard played. I think Vivian, that was the first time he played with him. I think. I'm not 100% sure. Oh, and did you ever see that George Michael uh, documentary? The Wham one? Yeah. Uh, I no, saw no, 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 no. It, it, it was just him. And evidently, he practiced for like five days what, for, that, Freddie for that Freddie Mercury thing. It was thing. amazing. Really? It was that important. Him. Other other bands were going on for like a couple yeah. hours and that was a good platform Five for days. extreme too. Oh, it was amazing. Yeah, we feel that. So, brother Shred, man, you are, I know you're the master of Shred. You're my brother in Shred. I thank you for putting your trademark style on this solo oh. on the record, man. That's an honor. I appreciate oh, it. Oh no, man. right back at now you. Now it's man. time for gum. To even, exactly. to even concern. Wait, hold on. Not quite yet. Where can everybody follow you guys? Ah, so Adam Holland official is by Instagram. And Adam Holland Music is my website, which has my link tree, which takes you to YouTube, which takes you to Spotify, which takes you to Inst it takes you everywhere. So, and Rapture is the name of the record. It's on all the streaming platforms. And the track we're talking about today is called Up the Hill, and uh, has the master, the master of shred, Mr. Derek. Yay. Yay. What about you? I'm good. You follow, follow him, you, you follow him <laughs> you'll follow me. <laughs> you got two different accounts on Instagram. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> it's a whole thing. It's okay. Okay. That's right. how we like it. All right. Very mysterious. There it is. Uh, well, I got my mic. Oh. Follow me at Mr. Shred Official at Masters of Shred. Make sure you subscribe to this YouTube channel. Show your support and uh, check out our merch at mastersofshred.com. And stay tuned for some more Talking Shred episodes to come. Yay.